This is Into the Multiverse with Josh Peck. Hello and welcome to Into the Multiverse. Today we're going to talk about quantum entanglement, but not over space. Well, we'll probably talk a little bit about that, but over time, which is something extremely interesting and very different. Uh, also, could time actually be a dimension of space and not time at all? Is time just an illusion? Uh, we're going to talk about all that and more on today's episode of Into the Multiverse. Now, if you haven't had a chance to do so, make sure you subscribe. You have to click the bell to let YouTube know that you want to be notified every time uh, we put one of these episodes up. But in case YouTube does not notify you, which is typically the case, just know that every Thursday at 9 a.m. Central Time, you will get a new episode of Into the Multiverse right here on YouTube.com slash Into the Multiverse. And uh, also we're on Roku and a bunch of other places, PTL Network, uh, Blog Talk Radio, all sorts of places that you can find into the multiverse. So this is kind of a strange thing to talk about. It's definitely mind-bending, but it's really cool, too. Uh, so you probably remember there have been episodes that we've done on this show about quantum entanglement and what that actually is. Quantum entanglement refers to the idea that two particles can become essentially entangled with one another in some kind of mysterious way that we still don't really fully understand, but they become entangled in such a way that if you alter or measure one particle, you can observe the, the, the same thing on the other particle. But the weird thing is, these particles could be light years apart, and there's no time interval between when an observation is made on one and then the change happens on, on the other. There's no time whatsoever, which is very strange. And this is what led Einstein, actually, to call this spooky action at a distance. He was not a fan of the idea, but it has been proven uh, experimentally over and over and over again to be the case. But what we don't know is why. Why this is actually occurring, how it could possibly work, uh, because typically to send information from one place to another, especially light years away, you need uh, some interval of time. It takes time to do that. And the fastest thing that we know about is light, uh, photons, the speed of light. And uh, this seems to operate faster than that, which is supposed to be physically impossible. Now, we have talked about that on this show before, and I've given my thoughts on it. Perhaps it could involve some extra spatial dimensions that we're not aware of, and we have no way of measuring. You know, maybe that is what allows this to happen. It would be similar to, if you remember our analogy of Flatland, a two-dimensional universe. It would be similar if I put two fingers in Flatland, and then the Flatlanders, when they see the two fingers move, moving around, they look at them as two separate objects because they don't see up, so they can't see where, the, where they connect. All they see is two-dimensional slices of my fingers. Now, if I were to keep doing that, you know, if I were to keep pushing my fingers through, eventually these two things would converge into one thing, you know, my wrist. Um, but if they, they, could, they could measure one of the circles, one of the two-dimensional slices of my fingers, they could measure that, and depending on what type of test they did, let's say that they're uh, measuring pulse or something, and they, they see that uh, they can measure my pulse through this finger, well, then they would notice the same thing on this one, too. And it might lead them to wonder how these two-dimensional circles are entangled. Well, it's not really an entanglement exactly. Uh, you know, they're actually connected in higher dimensional space uh, by my wrist, and you know, and, and it's all part of a larger construct. And maybe that's what we're looking at when it comes to photons, and maybe uh, that's how certain particles can become entangled. But that's not exactly the end of the weirdness. So now physicists are looking at entanglement across time, meaning that one particle can entangle with itself across the span of time. And the weird thing is, when you do the same types of experiments on that, you notice the same types of changes. But the weird, the weird thing is, I mean, of course, you would expect that going forward in time, if you make a change to a particle uh, at one point in time and then wait a while, you're going to see that same change. But the strange thing is it goes backwards as well. Now, the only way that we can test this, because we don't have access to time travel or anything like that, is by doing different studies and having the two scientists involved, or the two teams of scientists involved, unaware of what types of changes are being made. So, for example, if, uh, if, if one set of scientists measures a particle that is going to be entangled with itself, you know, in the future, uh, measures a particle right now, and then, say, 
just for sake of analogy, let's say an hour from now, a second team of scientists decides to alter that entangled particle once it's, once it's entangled with itself, then they can, they can compare those results and see that what they actually measured in the past is the same change that was made in the, in the future. And they've been able to do this enough times to show that it's not just by chance that it happens to be true sometimes, that there is actually a quantum time entanglement happening here between particles, which is really weird. So that brings to mind the question, what if we're actually looking at the same phenomena here? What if it's actually the same thing? You know, instead of space, it's over time, but what if space and time are actually the same thing? What if time is just a dimension of space that we have no real way to comprehend and the only little bit of it that we get is what uh, we, we can interact with? You know, time measures change. That's essentially what time is. But imagine again the two-dimensional Flatland universe. If I take a Flatlander out of Flatland, uh, and remember, flat, a Flatlander would have just a vertical line of vision. That's all he would have. But if I move him if I, if I, let's say, drop him and, and he starts moving down the third dimension that he has no real way to comprehend, his vertical line, his vertical field of view would be constant change. You know, every, every, every new second dimension that he's going down, which is every, every, every slice of our three-dimensional reality, he would notice a change. Change would continually happen. Whatever he's looking at would, depending on what he's looking at, it would, it would change and shift and it would seem to get smaller and get bigger. What if that's what time is? What if that's what time is for us? What if we're actually, in a sense, rising up or falling down in a fourth dimensional space and what we're seeing as change is really just three-dimensional segments of a larger universe uh, that we can only take in one segment at a time. Now, those segments are incredibly fast. It's called Planck time. It's actually the, 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 the smallest measurable, not even really measurable today, but it's just the smallest amount of time possible. Uh, it's, it's, it, it connects with what's called the Planck length, which is um, its smallest length possible. So the time that it takes a photon to travel the Planck length, that's Planck time. It's something like 10 to the minus 43 seconds or something like that. But imagine that. If a Flatlander lived in a three-dimensional universe, but he was only able to see two dimensions of it at a time, and let's say he was on a rotating planet or something like that, uh, that, that rotation, that, that, that change could be considered time. But here's, here's the consequence of that. What makes this really weird is if that's true, the Flatlander himself would have to be a three-dimensional uh, physical body. He would, he would have to inhabit a three-dimensional physical body himself, but his awareness, his, his, his perception would only be two-dimensional. He, he wouldn't know that he was, uh, uh, let's say, a sphere. And you, if, if, th if the third dimension was time for a flatlander, he actually would be a sphere, but his, his consciousness or his perception would be the thing that is moving through the third dimension. You know, you could think of, let's say, uh, if, if it's falling, you could, you could think of the, the bottom of the ball, the bottom section as that's birth. You know, that, that's when the new Flatlander comes into existence and then he grows throughout time. You know, really it's just the ball falling through the third dimension, but it grows throughout time. He's living his life. And then when the Flatlander starts to die, it shrinks again until it, until it disappears. You know, what, what if something similar, and of course it's not a perfect analogy, there are no perfect analogies when considering something like this, but what if time is actually something similar to that for us? What if there is a fourth dimension of time that we're, uh, in, a sense, in, a, in a sense, rotating through uh, or moving through, and the change that we're able to see just in three dimensions is actually our movement through the fourth dimension. It's really weird and trippy stuff, but uh, this is not the first time this has been discussed. This possibility has actually been discussed for over a hundred years. Now, going back to entanglement, there's actually another theory of time, that time is just an emergent phenomena from quantum entanglement itself. And actually, Don Page with William Wooters developed this 
theory developed this. And if that name Don Page sounds familiar, it's because in my book Abaddon Ascending, uh, Don Page was nice enough to offer me an interview to talk about CERN uh, and, and things like that. Don Page is a Christian. Uh, he's a brilliant, brilliant scientist. You should check out his work if you have an opportunity to do so. But he, he was the one that developed this theory that possibly time is just an emergent property or an emergent phenomena uh, of quantum entanglement. Now, you might be asking, what is emergence? What, what is an emergent phenomenon? What does that mean? Uh, well, you can think of it like this. Um, if you look at a flock of birds uh, and, and you look at it sort of as one solid thing and you try to measure it and you try to track it and see how it moves and everything, uh, well, really the flock isn't a real thing. The flock would be an emergent property of the birds themselves, of the birds moving in tandem and, and doing different things. So you could think of emergent properties in physics as, as sort of like that, or like a school of fish is, is a similar uh, analogy. That's what an emergent phenomena is. And the really cool thing is there's experimental evidence available today that lends support to this theory. Uh, the person who could, conducted it is named uh, Ekaterina Moreva, I want to make sure I get that name right, but it, le it lends support uh, to this idea that time might just be an emergent phenomena of quantum entanglement. So it's really weird, it's really cool to think about. Uh, time is definitely something that's been on my mind, uh, especially lately, just how it works, what it might be, uh, and there's several different ways of thinking about it. But I'm interested to know what you think. What do you think time is? Is it even real? Is it just relative to all of us? Uh, is it a dimension of space or is it this emergent thing from quantum entanglement? Uh, and if it is space, does that explain how quantum entanglement across space and across time is essentially the same kind of deal, that we see the same sorts of things? Does that mean that time travel might be possible if we start thinking of time as just another dimension of space. Very cool things to think about, and I want all your opinions. I, I love that uh, my audience is really engaged in the comment section, and you all have really interesting things to say, so I would love to see more about that. How would you define time? What do you think time is? What are all your thoughts? Now, if you haven't had a chance to do so yet, make sure you subscribe and click the little bell to tell YouTube that you want to be notified every time there's a new episode of of the multiverse. And if YouTube decides that you shouldn't watch the show and they just decide not to tell you about it, don't worry. Uh, you can fight back against what YouTube wants for you. Just remember that every Thursday at 9 a.m. Central Time, you'll get a brand new episode of Into the Multiverse, uh, and we will explore some pretty cool things in the weeks to come. All right. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, take care and God bless. From the Garden of Eden to our current day, dark Luciferian entities have worked to destroy mankind, while biblical prophecy points to a soon coming war between earthly governments and a clash of colossal proportions. Dr. Thomas Horn says you cannot understand much of the Bible unless you read and grasp the revelations in the Gods of War Super Collection. For your $35 donation during this very limited time offer, you'll receive The Alliance of Evil, the ground breaking new book by Pentagon analyst Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis, which unveils the prophetic new dual Cold War between the U.S., Russia, and China unfolding across the global spectrum now. The Gods of Ground Zero that explains the supernatural forces operating behind current global events. And The Last Clash of the Titans, which analyzes the most overlooked prophecies in the Bible and explains how Jesus Christ himself will soon go to war against the gods of antiquity. But with this three-volume critical collection, you'll also receive completely free of charge the brand new, never-before-released, full-length DVD, War of the Gods. Volume 1, Search for the Titans. Walk one-on-one -on -one with your personal guides Derek and Sharon Gilbert through a tour of the Holy Land, including Shiloh, Bethel, and Mount Hermon. You will see where the final battle between God and the rebel angels will take place. And you'll explore for yourself Sardinia's megalithic tombs of the giants, their connection to the ancient Canaanites, and the final battle. 
And that's not all. You'll also receive for a very limited time the best of the first annual Blessed Hope Prophecy Conference on DVD. This two-disc DVD collection is jam-packed with over 11 hours of mind-boggling revelations from presenters like Dr. Thomas R. Horn on Deep State Saboteurs and The Secret Destiny of America. Sharon Gilbert on the return of the ancients through pharmacia, necromancy, and virtual reality. Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis on the inside war against President Trump by elite secret societies. And unforgettable presentations from celebrated theologian Dr. Michael Lake, Derek P. Gilbert, Josh Peck, and more. But we're still not done. Skywatch TV's Off the Record series is backed by popular demand with a brand new, never before aired DVD, The Gods of War Edition, featuring exclusive interviews with Detective Carl Gallops, Senior Pentagon Analyst Robert McGinnis, Derek and Sharon Gilbert on the coming hyper battle between the forces of God and the titans of biblical prophecy. This content is only available in this exclusive offer and will not be aired anywhere else. Included for a limited time with the Gods of War Super Collection. This unprecedented collection sold separately holds a retail value of $220. All six items, yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. This without a doubt is the largest special offer of the summer and is available only while supplies last. So don't delay. The Gods of War Super Collection, available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order online or call 1-844-750-4985.